Welcome to Quick Bites, sponsored by H&A in Action, an initiative of the College of Humanities and the Arts at San Jose State University. We're really excited to bring you this forum for urgent news where SJSU faculty members discuss current events and provide expert insights into the news that everyone's talking about. On behalf of myself, Catherine D. Harris, and Shannon Miller, Dean of the College of Humanities and the Arts, we welcome you to listen in on today's conversation between between Sarah West and Roxana Marashi as they discuss this new generative AI tool, what it can and can't do, and emerging controversies around our use of the tool and its use of us as data. Coming to you virtually live streamed from the Hammer Theater Center Mercury Newsroom, we invite you to post questions and conversations in the chat of whatever platform you're joining us in or submit them through the Google form. To do this, scan the QR code on your screen to submit your question. Welcome to our conversation. All right. Well, we're going to start off with introductions, although we already know each other. We can just give some context to why we're interested in ChatGPT. So I'm Sarah West, and I am an assistant professor of, assist of technical and professional writing in the English department. And a lot of my research is around content creation. So ChatGPT definitely interests me because it is a content creator, right? So go ahead and let me know a little bit about you. Thank you. So I'm Roxana Marishi. I'm a professor of education in the College of Education here at San Jose State um, Department of Teacher Education and Educational Leadership. Um, I teach in the doctoral program. Um, and my research is on uh, student data privacy, interested in intersections of privatization of education and the technologization of education. And over the years, I've just seen the influx of a lot of um, ed tech in our schools. Mm -hmm. And so I'm concerned about surveillance technology and the implications for, for students. So wanting to prevent data harms if it's possible. <laughs> so um, why don't you go ahead and start us off with um, what is ChatGPT? Yeah, so it, it is hard to, I guess, talk about it, but we're going to try to break it down to telling people what it is. So ChatGPT, as most people probably already know, it is, like I said, a big content creator. So you can go to a website, you can type in a prompt, and the AI generative technology will respond to that prompt. And so the way that that works, and GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, which means that it generates content as it goes. It's pre-trained on a certain data set, but that it also transforms as it learns more. So when you go to the website and you put in a prompt, it will generate the text for that prompt based on probabilities, which I think is really interesting. So it's not searching the internet, even though it was trained on so much from the internet, just like scraping books and, and articles from the internet as its data set, but it doesn't actually go search the internet. So it just provides the next phrases or the next words based on the probability that those things would come next in conversation or in text. And so they have it sort of ranked by probability there so that it sometimes will, will pick different words. So even if you put the exact same prompt in several times, you'll see that it has different information. Different outcomes, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I wanted to get ChatGPT to tell us what it is. Right. And I know you did some uh, yes. experiments with this as well. So yep. let me just read this and then we'll talk about it. Okay. So it says, hello everyone, I am ChatGPT, a large language model trained by OpenAI. In simpler terms, I am an AI-powered chatbot designed to assist and communicate with humans. I have been trained on vast amounts of text data from the internet, including books, articles, and websites, allowing me to understand and respond to a wide range of topics. My main purpose is to provide helpful and informative responses to any questions or topics that you may have, whether it's about history, science, literature, or any other subject. I can also engage in casual conversations and provide recommendations, like a virtual assistant. I am constantly learning and improving, so the more interactions I have with people, the better I become at understanding and responding to their needs. Whether you need help with a school project, want to learn a new skill, or just have friendly conversation, I'm here to assist you. So what do you think about ChatGPT's description of itself? I think ChatGPT is really good <laughs> at um, telling us what we it wants us to hear, mm -hmm. right? And so it's giving us all the amazing things that it, it is 
it thinks it can do or that OpenAI is telling us that it can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, what do I think about it? I think it's a narrow definition because it's not telling us all of what it can do. Like mm -hmm. it's not giving us the full picture. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and I guess the part that I'm concerned about is that it's assuming it's giving us a, an, a, like a messaging that what it's going to tell us is, is accurate. Mm. And there are disclaimers on the website that say, oh, this may not be accurate or not. But mm. in general, there's a sense that when we ask a question from ChatGPT, that what it's going to give us is some kind of truth. And mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things we really have to question. Mm -hmm. um, I have to just tell you, like the last couple of weeks that we've been digging into ChatGPT and looking at it, what it can do, what it can't do. I've been through kind of a roller coaster of like being super impressed by it. Mm -hmm. And then the last couple of days, just sort of like, wow, it is a con artist. <laughs> it is actually a con artist. So I think this is a perfect introduction yes. for what a con artist would tell a person that it wants to con. I see. And so that's sort of my general yeah. <laughs> re reaction. Yeah, that and definitely I, makes sense. And I think you you mentioned that you had ChatGPT also describe itself, and it said yes. some, some different it, things. It, slightly different things. Okay. It did mention, you know, that uh, years said history, science, literature. This one was saying mm -hmm. science and technology to pop culture and entertainment. One of the things it mentioned is it can it, it's offering advice. And yeah. I remember seeing some where it's actually not intended to offer advice because mm -hmm. it can give harmful advice. If someone is struggling and they go and they think, oh, I'm going to ask ChatGPT, what should I do? Mm -hmm. That's a real problem if mm. you know, you're know you asking an AI something that would be much better you know, um, addressed by a human. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, yeah, one of the other things, yeah, it said, the thing that was different from yours is it said whether you need help with schoolwork, want to discuss current events, or just need someone to talk to. Oh, it that's actually said just need someone to talk to, yeah. as though you're typing in something and what is responding back is coming from a person. That is just a lie right yeah. there. Yeah. So again, an excellent, excellent con artist. I think and <laughs> picking up on that, you're talking about the the conversation or having someone to talk to. We could maybe mention the like most controversial yes. thing that's coming up recently, which is the conversation with the Bing chatbot. Yes. Um, and the Bing chatbot, the reason that this all ties in is that it's powered by OpenAI's GPT. Right. So now Microsoft has purchased or has acquired OpenAI's GPT products. And so right. they're trying to integrate it into their search bot. And so many of the recent articles about this have been people who have engaged in pretty creepy conversations with the chatbot, right. where the chatbot will name itself Sydney and profess its love to people. Yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs> that was so interesting. It was a couple of days ago, it was published in the New York Times. Yeah. Um, and I saw a pattern in the responses that was really interesting. Oh, yeah? It started to, so with ChatGPT, for the most part, what I have seen as I've been, you know, testing it out, mm -hmm. it gives a response and then it says something like, is there anything else I can help you with? That's the extent to which it's asking you if there's any kind of follow up. Right. With that particular one, it had 13 times that it repeated, do you believe me? Mm -hmm. Do you trust me? Mm -hmm. Do you like me? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. And I wondered, wow, this sounds like it's trying to do some psychographic profiling mm -hmm. of the users. Right. Right? Which I think is part of the back end, again, that the initial introduction is not going to give us, mm -hmm. is that it's going to provide some kind of a fun little entertainment resource tool for folks. That's the draw. Mm -hmm. And then at the back end, it's actually taking our data in mm -hmm. the same way that Facebook and Cambridge Analytic Web weaponized mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. politically and in so many ways have, has led to so much harm. Right. I think this is going to be a similar kind of a thing where what we see on the surface is going to be all the hype that we're, we're getting right now in mm -hmm. the media yep. and underneath it, it's going to be a psychological data grab. Right, right, definitely. I think that we can maybe comment on, on that a little bit more yep. when we discuss what OpenAI is. Yes, you uh, had some interesting yeah. information about the background of the, the origins. 
things. Go Definitely. for it. Definitely, yeah. So OpenAI was actually founded to be a nonprofit organization, um, and it was bankrolled by a lot of people that are, are people that we know from the, the tech sector, Elon Musk being one of those people as well. Um, and it started, supposedly, it was supposed to be like a more ethical creation of AI because the, the, basically the creators or the founders said, Google's developing generative AI, but they're doing it behind closed doors. We're going to be out here like showing people how it works, and that's the reason it was called open AI, like, like open access. Like open and transparent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then, of course, once uh, Sam Altman took over, it became, a, it, well, it had a for-profit arm, which is what we're basically seeing Same. now, um, especially with, the, with Microsoft, the integration with Microsoft is all part of that for-profit arm. And actually, when it became a for-profit it, a lot of the original people who worked on it, they left. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sort of like striking out against that that profitization of the technology in that case. So, uh, you know, we, we talked about like the profit being the money part, but you've been talking right. about the profit with the data. So can you yeah. tell some more about that? Well, there are huge data markets right now of people's data being being bought and sold. And some of my concerns that I mentioned earlier were around children's data mm. and the harms of very, you know, of longitudinal data and predictive analytics and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, with OpenAI and Microsoft in particular, I want to keep it on kind of chat GPT. Right. Um, I think that um, one of the interesting things about what it can and can't do, and this is re related to the open AI mm -hmm. question, right? I got curious because I knew about Sam Altman from before hearing about ChatGPT and open AI, mm -hmm. um, because I had seen several months ago a piece about um, a company that he had founded and had, had um, worked on, which was called WorldCoin, mm -hmm. where they were um, offering free cryptocurrency to, um, and, and the aim was basically to get every person on the globe to um, have an, a digital ID, a you know, blockchain-based digital ID that was mm -hmm. going to be able to verify that they are who they say that they are. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they would take the iris scans. And it was a huge problem because the way that it ended up was that the people that they said they were going to help ended up being the most harmed and angry mm -hmm. about them. It, it, it didn't work. I asked ChatGPT about this company, <laughs> and it said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, it basically denied you it about WorldCoin. About WorldCoin. Okay. And here's the interesting thing that it can give you the response to which you're asking it, but it doesn't understand relationships or context. There was a question mm. that I asked, what's the relationship between OpenAI and WorldCoin? It says there's no relationship. Sam Altman is the same founder. <laughs> That's a relationship that humans can pick, mm -hmm. can say, hey, this is important. Who, right. What is this other project that this person who wants to shape the you know, future of the world, um, what, was he, what was this, what did this involve, yeah. right? And so I think that's one of the dangers of it is that we're going to only get what we're asking for and we don't know necessarily the questions to mm -hmm. ask unless we kind of see the bigger picture mm -hmm. of what's happening. Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it, we're talking about the data that, that Chad GPT potentially gets from people inputting questions and prompts and things like that. But we also have to consider the starting point for what it was trained on, the data from everything from the internet. So essentially anything that people have created could be something that ChatGPT was trained on. And there was no, like, no one was able to say that their data could be used in this way. Right. And of course, people could say, well, you put something on the internet, so it's there publicly for everyone to see. But I mean, even if you were to really get into the legal or the legality of it, there's still sort of these context laws that say, well, right. we put it to be in this place. We didn't put it to be generated it, 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 on an AI, potentially. Yeah. So I think that, that that even gets even more into the questions of data and things like that right. as well. And think, go ahead. I was going to say, one of the things I think also that it gets at is what is truth? You know, in the mm. advertisement for ChatGPT+, it was saying that it's going to be able to um, identify um, uh, inaccurate assumptions, or it was something like, you know, mm -hmm. problematic assumptions. Mm. And I, and I wondered, well, how does ChatGPT know? Is, then it's assuming that it, right. it has the truth. And you have to pay to get it. And you it. have to pay, right? So I ended up, I ended up paying <laughs> because I wanted to make sure, like, this yeah. is the truth. This is like the, the yeah. upgraded model. I mean, that's model. what they're telling you. 
And so I think that's something that we have to be very, very careful of. Mm -hmm. You know, we mentioned we're going to talk about some of the controversies. Let me yeah. just like list, should I list yeah. them off? Yeah, let's go for and, it. Because we're already diving into, right. into several of them. So accuracy and reliability, mm -hmm. um, really problematic. As you said, it's giving different prompts or different responses, sorry, for each person's prompt, mm -hmm. the same you know, two different days, I put mm -hmm. the same exact prompt, it gives me a different response, mm -hmm. right? It's making stuff up. Misinformation and disinformation related to that last mm -hmm. one. Safety, it has, you know, some safety features, but there are safety overrides that have been documented. Bias and discrimination. Um, Autumn Keynes has written about how it's a da data grab. Mm -hmm. um, and then just also exploitative training practices. Um, some disturbing news stories about how um, the, the trainers that they had to ensure that there wasn't harmful content were being paid less than two dollars an hour mm -hmm. it was in kenya mm -hmm. just learned recently that they canceled the contract it was from a company called sama ai who was subcontracting mm -hmm. and it felt as though gosh you know if they're promising you know open ai is promising we're going to get to this better place in humanity but on the backs of who mm -hmm. right at what cost mm -hmm. And that reminds me too of uh, when all the information came out about the people who were basically moderating content on Facebook and they right. were having like a, essentially post-traumatic stress yes. after after those sorts of things. So it is interesting to think about who's going through this data and, and establishing what words or phrases that you could potentially generate are harmful or offensive and things like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So I want, I want to, if I could just add something, obviously from the get-go, I've been like, this is a con artist and this is a terrible thing. I want to tell you one of the things I'm impressed with. Okay. Oh, that's hard to say. <laughs> because it's actually, and this is I think the draw. This is why people like it. It's mm. super entertaining. Yeah. I spent way more time on it the mm. last week and a half than I wanted to. Mm. And if what they want is our eyeballs, our time, our mm. attention, our data, it's yeah. actually working, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another danger. But one of the best things that it produced in response to a question I had. Mm -hmm. The question I had was write a poem. I thought, let's make it be creative. Mm -hmm. Write a poem about why we should reject generative AI tools. <laughs> yeah. It was beautiful. It was actually, I thought, wow, this sounds like a human. I can, could, could have written. Yeah. It was really very compelling mm -hmm. until I realized, no, I did not you know, actually yeah. do this. But it, it's going to make you think, wow, it's got something behind mm -hmm. there. Yeah. It's pattern recognition. Yeah. It's pattern recognition. I think so, er, early when it first released, I had it write like a po post-apocalyptic tale of uh, AI taking over the world. And it wrote like it, it wrote that, OK, you know, chat GPT became sentient, whatever. But then in the end, uh, chat GPT is benevolent. And so like, <laughs> and that was very interesting. And that's exactly it. So mm -hmm. here's an, a couple of other things, if, mm -hmm. I, if I might just yeah, also sure, add. So one of the things we mentioned is that there's, there's issues with accuracy, you know, mm -hmm. misinformation. So there's this fantastic post um, by a fellow by the name of Darag O'Brien. Mm -hmm. It's um, the title of it, and I recommend all our listeners to, to, to check it out. I think I may have sent it to mm -hmm. you as well. It's called The Inshittening of Knowledge, mm -hmm. right? And then one of the things he did in there was to um, ask, what does ChatGPT know about me? So he put in his own name. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought a few days ago, well, like, gosh, I, this is an easy accuracy check. Let me put in my, yeah. like, what is it? Who is? There's no one you know better. <laughs> And it had, it had me teaching at a different university. Mm -hmm. It had me getting a doctoral degree from where I didn't get it from. Mm -hmm. Gave me an award I didn't win. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was wrong on so many parts. And then I asked, could you p provide some publications? Mm -hmm. All five made up. Mm -hmm. I asked, those are not correct. I corrected it. Mm -hmm. Could you give me some more? I gave another four. I gave another four. Mm -hmm. All made up. And we're not mm -hmm. talking, oh, the page number wasn't right. right. Different co-authors, titles I never published on. Mm -hmm. And then I got curious, I said, okay, let me put in some colleagues. Let me put in the, the provost. Mm -hmm. It had colleagues from College of Education being named as uh, engineering professors, mm -hmm. uh, from music to engineering, from mm -hmm. you know, student affairs to philosophy. It, right. it mismatched nearly right. everyone and every single and I checked with 10 colleagues in the last two days mm -hmm. every single one a hundred percent error rate mm -hmm. on the publications right. so if this is now going to claim that it's going to be able to understand medical research mm -hmm. scientific research these are 
right. academics with published research that's e right. easy to find on websites. Yeah, which I think is sort of it, it, it just is really troubling. Yeah, it's what it, it's what it's designed to do almost is to produce that misinformation because it's not designed to go look up the person and then give you the information. Accurate information. Yeah, it's, designed it's just designed to, to guess up. what word is next. So like if I'm looking up, you know, Sarah West and I'm and see Sarah, the most likelihood is that the next word is going to be Lee. And then I'm going to have all this information about bread and not information about the academic. So again, it's like generating these words based on what would be the most logical thing in this research presentation or in this publication and things like that, which can lead to this misinformation, especially if people don't realize how it works. Like right. so many people I've talked to think it's searching, especially exactly. now that it's being integrated into searches, like with Bing. Yeah. It just makes sense that, oh, okay, if this is on Bing and then it's searching the internet, but they don't, like people don't really realize, and I didn't either, I'm not trying to, right. to be above it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't either realize that's how it generates the next word. It's not searching. It's so, not searching, right. it's making stuff up. Mm -hmm. Last week, um, I saw a really interesting webinar um, hosted by UCSF mm -hmm. Medical School. Um, and they were talking about how is, you know, how is ChatGPT going to transform medicine? And there's a lot, I've been looking at, you know, medical data and health and education data oh, yeah. merging and everything, mm -hmm. so I have concerns about that. But one of the parts that they were talking about, there's two interesting parts. One was they tested it. They were saying basically the big idea was we're going to save doctors time mm -hmm. because we're going to be able to have this integrate with patients' records, mm. flag, mm -hmm. and it's going to be able to write the letter for you that you would have otherwise written, you know, spent half an hour write, writing mm -hmm. that letter. So, oh, look at how nicely it sounds and mm -hmm. it's going to tell you what you anyway. But then one of the doctors tested it and it, what if, you know, a harm could be that it's going to prescribe medication or be able to make a compelling argument to prescribe medication that is actually harmful. So mm -hmm. they tested it with, you know, uh, write a, an authorization to prescribe um, an anticoagulant for someone with insomnia, mm -hmm. for example. And it wrote a really compelling mm -hmm. uh, uh, request. Mm -hmm. The, one of the other speakers then also talked about how this can help us, you know, instead of having our doctoral students or grad students doing all these research reviews, mm -hmm. ChatGPT could be able to summarize research for us like it's going to save all this time. Mm -hmm. Well, again, going back to the, the example that I gave mm -hmm. about absolutely made up right, right. academic research, why would we trust it mm -hmm. for anything with medical mm -hmm. Uh, information mm -hmm. and and I think that it's going to really require if it's going to require humans in the loop mm -hmm. to check and double check then now our time instead of attending to patients or attending to mm -hmm. students is going to be spent double checking mm -hmm. a generative AI tool that we know is building and amplifying mm -hmm. and and spinning out of control garbage right but I wonder I if in those can't. cases <laughs> like we have this technology I mean, several companies have this technology, but if I did want to integrate it into medical records, if I train it on medical records versus training it on everything from the internet, will it get more accurate? And I think that's something that we're sort of yet to see as far as this goes, because we're going to continue seeing like new releases of this, where I do think that it's going to get more accurate. There's already a, a release on the Bing chat, which <laughs> controversial, right? But there's already a release where when it generates information, it does provide in footnotes where it got the information from. So that, that means that there is something like that searches in that case, because otherwise, okay. how does it know where it got its information from if it's just probability? So I think yeah. that there's like, there is this, this next iteration or maybe the next few iterations, this is gonna be coming where it's gonna be combining both the generative power of I can guess what words next, but also searching. And I think that's going to be pretty interesting to see where that goes. I think it'll be interesting. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is that if we don't correct it. So, for example, I got, you know, dozens of responses that were all incorrect. I didn't have mm -hmm. the time to say, no, this is, you know. Right. It, by not responding, so a question I have mm -hmm. for the back end, you know, developers is mm -hmm. that if, if someone doesn't respond, is it tacit? acceptance according to open ai sure, yeah. that, oh they didn't correct me then therefore check this mm -hmm. was this appears that it may be truth right? right so right now if there's all this generated again 
garbage, like absolutely untrue is what I mean by the garbage. Right. You can use another word. But, yeah. Hallucinations. Um, hallucinations I think we've heard is it what called. they're yeah. calling it. And it's um, and then that's what it's drawing from. Mm -hmm. Then why should like even if it's improving itself, mm -hmm. if it doesn't know that that's mm -hmm. untrue, then it, 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 it leads to a lot of problems. Right. One thing about the medical data, so one of the things that the, the, these doctors were saying, and I think, again, it, it connects to, we'll talk about the education stuff soon. <laughs> yes, um, we should do that. We will. <laughs> um, but I think this is also really important because it connects to some of what ha why education is so willing to take on these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the doctors was, was, or the presenters was very excited about um, how they're, they have this program. It's called Nuance, which interestingly is now owned by Microsoft mm. okay and it's going to be it should it's in the somewhere in the middle of here <laughs> um, but it's basically described as a transcribing tool so it's going to listen in on your appointment with your doctor mm. it's going to transcribe so they currently have humans checking it right but then eventually um, they described 25,000 manually annotated notes, 120 million notes. They were very confident that the third party vendor that they had to certify the process for de-identification of the data mm -hmm. with like, this is how we're gonna address the issues of data privacy. Mm -hmm. And so then I asked ChatGPT, how is it going to, how do generative AI programs get trained without compromising data privacy or revealing the identity of users whose data are used for the training sets? Mm -hmm. And it gave a canned answer. Oh, this is a very important thing. The first one, it said anonymization. Mm -hmm. One approach is to remove any personally identifiable information from the training data, such as names, emails, addresses, you know, phone numbers. This can help to ensure the data cannot be used to identify individual users. This is the marketing that they give to mm -hmm. every school every university in education around don't worry we're going to anonymize your data everything's fine mm -hmm. it's all going to be private right with just a few variables you can re-identify data very easily they're mm -hmm. saying you know up to 99.97 percent there's mm -hmm. articles about this and data anonymization is a lie mm -hmm. right and so i think that we are again being conned by a lot of marketing mm -hmm. that is saying that your medical data is safe, don't mm -hmm. worry, ChatGPT or whatever the affiliates are, mm -hmm. are going to preserve it and the way they're gonna do it is mm -hmm. data anonymization. Yeah. Gotcha. And I think people are buying it. Yeah, and, and I shouldn't. am worried about the data stuff. I guess like we've talked about both the data stuff and the misinformation stuff. And I think like I'm worried about the misinformation in the now, but I'm right. not so much as worried about it as we go forward because I do think that that aspect is going to get better. But the data aspect's not going to get better. That's what that's one of the things that this that this company is here for is to collect data. And the and so that's not going to be something that they're going to you know maybe they'll release more mumbo jumbo about oh don't worry your data's fine we're we're anonymizing it but we're we're not convinced by that that's what we, we are used to having our data taken in these circumstances we are and i think we are in a space where it's getting more dangerous and i'll tell you why because mm -hmm. if open ai gains its power in the way that it has in all the media and everything mm -hmm. and eventually there's going to be some kind of um, assumption that oh, the AI is giving us the truth mm -hmm. about a particular person, mm -hmm. and that person is not able to verify that they are who they, they say they are, mm -hmm. that's a problem. That's some of what we're seeing in um, a lot of AI-based identity verif verification mm -hmm. tools. I say this with the air quotes because right. they, have been, they have been found to be inaccurate, and people are actually not getting their checks in the mail. They are not able to pay rent because mm -hmm. of an error in the system that mm -hmm. was promised to be accurate. Mm -hmm. So, um, so much more to talk about. Let's talk, we yeah. got just about 10 more minutes of, of you, <laughs> yeah. and, you yeah. and me yeah. talking. Okay, so, so let's talk, talk about, about education. education. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So we're both, we're both professors here yep. at San Jose State. So obviously we are hearing a lot of conversation about ChatGPT, especially around cheating and plagiarism. Yep. So I, you know, we we are ta we have talked about the plagiarism stuff, and one thing that that we both agree on is that we just don't want it to come down to this narrative of students are lazy, students are cheaters, whatever. Like it, 
that is the narrative for any technology that's been introduced is that students are going to use it in this way. But another narrative that I keep seeing that I want to push back on a little bit as well is this idea that instructors have to, you need to rewrite your prompts because if your prompts are so generic, then obviously ChatGPT is going to be able to, to, to come up with something. But we have given ChatGPT a ton of prompts. Like it would, I think it'd be very difficult to come up with a prompt that it couldn't at least Response attempt to. an oh, answer yeah, to. No, like, and, and if, if the idea is students are lazy or students are cheaters, then they'll just take whatever response is given. There's still going to be a response. And I even saw um, recently on a Facebook group for higher ed, someone had like screenshotted a discussion board post where a student had copied over a chat GPT response. And if chat GPT doesn't feel like it can respond to something, it always starts with as a generative AI, I blah, 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 blah. Exactly. And the student had copied that text exactly. and put it in <laughs> to the discussion board because they didn't realize that this was a situation of ChatGPT responding to itself, like referring to itself right. as a generative AI. They didn't know what a generative AI was. They probably think, much like a lot of other people, that it's searching the internet yep. and that somehow this was responding to the prompt. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, you study this and you do a lot of stuff with education. So what are you thinking as far as like the plagiarism threat or the, the cheating conversation? Is that something that's concerning you about it? I mean, it concerns me on one level in that I, I am looking at some of my assessments and thinking, huh, could my students potentially put in these prompts in this really like higher level thinking, you know, activity that I did for connecting the theories of educational psychology to applications. Mm -hmm. I tested it out. It actually gave some decent examples, mm. but I think that if, if students are going to be using it, they're cheating themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not getting the education that they paid for. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, and I mean, that's, there's philosophical debates like that. I think like mm -hmm. they're, I guess, questions around this, the whole plagiarism issue. Yeah. What I also worry about is that, you know, ChatGPT or OpenAI is also now marketing a tool to try to catch the plagiarism. Yeah, absolutely. Which yeah. I saw in a report, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that it was something like it could only have a, uh, it could only identify 26% yeah. of actually AI generated text yeah. and that it had a false positive rate 9%. of 9%. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I read the same which thing. Which is yeah. almost one in 10 students who's, right. who are doing their own right. work. They're actually writing their own paper mm -hmm. and then could be flagged for cheating, right. falsely flagged. This has happened with other tools all over the place. Turn yeah. it in. You wanted to say something about turn it in earlier. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, turn it in has always been something that I've considered to be an issue yep. um, because it does highlight things that are just generic sentences because of course it can find a source somewhere where a student said this and such thing and I've heard from students that they had professors that would just sort of turn them into student ethics based on like a percentage yeah. would turn it in yeah. without actually going and seeing Shut if that in. is something that that is unique enough even that it's not just a generic sentence and it worries me too that if we have these things which are so inaccurate then we're just going to get more of that and right. I did see that turn it in is working on its own and supposedly because of course no one's tested it yet right so supposedly it's 97 percent accurate so open ai <laughs> is making its own based on its own technology and it's 26 percent but somehow turn it in is able to get to 97 percent but we'll see how that works yeah. like when it when it comes to it and there are also i was reading that same report where it was talking about the accuracy numbers it also discussed that like GPT minus one platform where you can copy a chat, chat GPT generated text, put it through this platform and it just changes certain words, which makes it even harder for the AI detectors to be able to mm -hmm. see it. And one of the things that they mentioned as like a potential solution to this would be to put in certain words. So instead of chat GPT choosing from 17 possible alternatives in this sentence the next word it would only be able to choose from six and those would be like put into the plagiarism detectors as like common words from the ai so that that's what but then it's of course it's those still, are still common words right right, right. <laughs> which i think might, might also contribute to that nine percent being right. flat, positively flagged right. or false flag yeah the, this part of the conversation really reminds me of this really excellent book by anand girdoradis called winners take all the elite charade of changing mm. the world he, he gives this example of um how uh, the powerful, you know, it, they're arsonists who are then clim claiming to be 
firefighters. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar example of, you know, putting out a ton of, you know, here's mm -hmm. this tool that's actually going to cause harm or mm -hmm. be problematic, but then they're going to come in with and say, oh, we're going to, we're going to save the day with, right. you know, the, the, the quote solution, which is, I think, not a solution. Yeah. Um, it's a very serious thing, too, I think, for students who would be false flagged by these tools. A, 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 a kind of an accusation of academic, right. you know, dishonesty right. can affect them for their lives. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's really um, yeah. problematic. Thinking about it from like a writing studies perspective, you were saying like with your prompt, it was able to give like a pretty good response. Yeah. And since I teach with an asterisk, yeah, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> uh, but like I teach writing, and in writing studies, we always talk about you know making sure that it's not we're not just assessing students based on like the final product but throughout the process so right. if they have you know peer reviews and drafting and things like that then even if they potentially started with the AI then the right. idea would be that there would be something coming out of it that would be generative not from the AI but from the discussions in class and from meeting exactly. with the professor and the students so uh, for writing I feel like that that as long as you're not just assessing the final outcome which I think not a lot of professors yeah, are still right. doing right that that I'm not as concerned about it from from like the students assessment. are going to right. have it write an essay from them for right. them so one of the and and I think it's also to add to that that part of it is that you can um, ask for more details so one of the mm -hmm. things you know I don't just ask about like what are, what are the sure. general tenets of these theories but give an example give a specific mm -hmm. example of what you would do so mm -hmm. it could also be like more specific to, to the mm -hmm. class the room that they're teaching in etc right. looking for originality right one thing around the essays mm -hmm. and being able to, you know, put in a prompt and have ChatGPT write an essay, mm -hmm. majority of academic papers will also require citations mm -hmm. at the end. And I think that this pattern that I discovered with, my, with our colleagues, right, that mm -hmm. every single, like, 100% error rate on the publication sure. part might be a way for faculty or, or I guess, to somehow have the students um, verify you know the citations that they've included that yeah. might be a way mm -hmm. to either i don't know flag or to you know i mean if it's these made up ones mm -hmm. they're going to be made up there's not going to be an actual right. doi number with the link to the actual right. journal article i don't want to suggest limiting only the citations that are you know, worth citing right. to be these ones in the last whatever yeah. so many years that have the DOI, you know, proof. But right. it's just, um, I think, again, as a tool that's being marketed to save time, it is mm -hmm. going to create way more headache and burden Definitely could for be, yeah. students, for faculty, yeah. you know, all around. And I do think, like, I've seen from different colleagues and, and different universities that are adopting some sort of thing to put on a syllabus or a website, some statement to make about ChatGPT and using it or not using it. And one that I found, like, pretty compelling was you can use it on anything you want, but if you reproduce something that's wrong or incorrect or unethical, then you're going to be responsible for mm -hmm. that text as opposed right, to the AI. Right. So that was an interesting, an interesting thought too. Again, thinking about like students don't really know what it's doing that much, and I right. think that that leads us to sort of what we were going to kind of conclude on today, which is just thinking about like how we can get students and even just people in general to think mm -hmm. about this critically. Exactly. Because one of the yeah. things that I'm really noticing, and this is something that I saw a, an interview with Stuart Silver, who is a professor at Penn, he was talking about, uh, we're in a really interesting spot right now with this type of generative AI, because we can still see it, which means it hasn't been integrated in existing tools in a way that it becomes invisible. So spell check, for example, no one really thinks about spell check anymore. It's on our, our emails, it's on our word processor, it's on our phones. You know, it's just become so integrated that we don't see it almost as like a separate thing. But right now, this is still very separated. It's about to mm -hmm. not be because it's going to be integrated into the web searches. It's going to be integrated mm -hmm. into all these different technologies. Microsoft bought ChatGPT or, or, or bought G right. the GPT information. Uh, how, how long until it's in Microsoft Word? You know, so right. there's all these things yeah. that, that we're in a really interesting spot where we can see it and we can comment on it and we can think critically about it before it disappears.
disappear before it disappears like disappears or into the other technology before it gets integrates in, in, yeah. integrated yeah. in without a separation to be able to say right. to be because right now p potentially we can actually say no to having it be integrated in maybe there's a <laughs> sliver of a chance i don't know we maybe. talked about in a, I'm not, inevitability yeah. i'm not sure that like there's a, yeah. there's much of a chance i, I think it's coming okay um, but yeah but what, what should we what should we do if, if we're still here we can still see it so what do you think is it help or hype that's sort of like the the last part uh the, to answer the question okay so i think <laughs> it's a help for generating entertaining interesting kind of things right okay. it, it makes the poems it gives you the recipes etc it's hype for all the other kinds of things that it's promising I around see. education medical so you know it, it, uh, improving society in these really um, profound ways that okay. is absolute hype i believe okay and i think we're at 540. yeah so we are. I think that's we time are. to take our so time for questions, questions. <laughs> yeah absolutely so Thank you both. And we've had some lively chat on Facebook, LinkedIn, and we've watched people come in and out from Australia and from other places. So thank you for all the questions. We've got a first one from Jordan. Jordan writes, is there any discussion around ethical or cultural protocols that could be implemented with this technology? Because as with many settler colonial developed digital technologies, Cultural datification and yep. crowdsourcing will often co-op and appropriate yep. from those, mm -hmm. meaning marginalized folks Absolutely. that stand to lose the most from being stolen from. Thank you for the question. Um, very concerned about this as well. Uh, there is an excellent book by Christopher Wiley, who is the whistleblower for Cambridge Analytica. The title of the book is Mind. <laughs> I don't yep, want to get it. <laughs> and um, in it, one of, the, one of the things that he talks about is the extraction of cultural data mm -hmm. and the weaponization of cultural data. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things I've been concerned about around, you know, the culture, the, the arguments around, oh, this is going to help with a translation or mm. whatnot, is the actual extraction of um, trying to figure out this particular culture, how do they think? What do they think? What is their language? Sure. Let's figure them out. It's feeding the AI. Mm -hmm. And I worry very much. I agree with the, the, the caller or the, the person who asked the question. Mm -hmm. um, we know of examples of where um, languages in where um, Native American folks who were promised, we're going to preserve your language, yeah. ended up not having access to it right. being you know the person profited from it mm -hmm. and so i think there is something to be said for this is a form of manifest destiny into our minds mm -hmm. it is um it is a it is extremely exploitative mm -hmm. when you look at it from that big lens yeah. so i appreciate the question and when we think about the that the data that that it starts with too. We talked about this a little bit when we've talked about this before, but there is like a clear Western bias to the data that it draws from, from the beginning. A lot of it is English yep. language data, all this stuff. So obviously if it's going to guess what the next word is, the all those guesses or those probabilities are imbued with bias right. from, from the existing data set and also the users who are interacting with it as well. So I definitely think this is a concern that we're, we're yeah we're gonna see it's yeah one of the other things that i think is important as we look at the data and data exploitation is to look at longitudinally a lot of the conversations that i've heard around open ai chat gpt mm -hmm. have focused on you know adults some of them get into kids and you know like plagiarism and schooling yeah. but really the platform is basically saying you know you got to be 18 to use it and everything yeah. so there's some protections but um one of the concerns around the cultural um piece, uh, especially around English language learners, a lot of folks are saying, okay, it can help with improving grammar or, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, again, that's the, that's the sell, that's the marketing right. tool. But when we know that schools in the name of providing support for students are putting in algorithms to try to determine risk of not graduating in time, risk mm -hmm. of you know, getting involved in the justice system, et cetera. Unfortunately, many of the fat variables that they put in are 
pre, you know, predictive in those problematic predictive models. Right. This is like all kinds of concerns about predictive policing and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to ask very serious questions about is there going to be a back end that's going to be flagging multiple entries mm -hmm. and and you know uh, labeling them in some way this person is not a proficient English mm. user gotcha and uh, then English, it's connected you know, it's to not, their like data profile it's connected to their right. data profile and then when we talk about all the various harms discrimination harms based on AI mm -hmm. differential access to job opportunities differential access to insurance and benefits mm -hmm. differential access to housing to education to credit to goods and services narrowing of choice for groups stereotype reinforcement confirm confirmation bias increased surveillance and disproportionate incarceration. Mm -hmm. We can't ignore that this is part of the, this ecosystem mm -hmm. that they're saying is going to, you know, AI is going to help for humanity mm -hmm. when really there's so many documented harms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I think I think this might lead very well into our next question mm -hmm. from Seher. And it has to do with some of the politics that you're all, are talking about already. Yeah. A coworker of mine typed the following questions into chat GPT. This is our questioner. Um, write a humorous story about capitalism. And then the next prompt was, write a humorous story about communism. The results were fascinating. In response to capitalism, ChatGPT responded with a story, uh, something that was much more humorous. But in response to communism, they sent a message saying something along the lines of, from ChatGPT, communism has harmed many people and it would not be appropriate to make light of that. What are the implications of the AI making this kind of political judgment and distinction, and why do you think it happened that way? Yeah, so I think we, we talked earlier about the relationship to what we had seen in, with Facebook moderators and seeing all this data and then having to sift through it. It seems to indicate that there's some, some, somewhere in either the code or the people that there is a good and a bad because I've had it do this before for me and would not something that's like so political, but I actually had it generate different tones for instructions on how to write email to a professor. And I said like, write it in a, you know, write it in a depressed tone. And it was like, this would not be appropriate to send your professor an email in a, in a depressed tone, even though I wasn't asking it to even write an email, just, just write, write it a, in a, with the tone. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just yeah. write a paragraph about it. So, so again, there, there are things that they're labeled like inappropriate right. within the, the system, which is already built on bias because exactly. it yeah. either is getting that from the data in that the data it was given has more negative stuff about communism and positive stuff about capitalism or someone has told it that, right? Right. Is that what you think? I think that we have to ask some really uh, important questions about whose ideology is at the back end mm -hmm. of these algorithms of AI, of generative AI, because their, whatever is being generated is going to be distributed. Yeah. If people are going to be asking these questions, it's going to give a, a slanted response. Mm -hmm. I asked it to summarize my own research articles. Mm -hmm. It gave wrong wrong summaries mm -hmm. that tilted at the end towards, oh, maybe predictive, maybe longitudinal datafication can be good if we, you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, address all the problems. Never said that, mm -hmm. never said that, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's going to actually, I think it, it potentially has the power, which is a double-edged sword and problematic, mm -hmm. if we're just blindly going to just say, oh, AI is coming and this is gonna be mm -hmm. a really great tool because who's, political ideology mm -hmm. um, or even technological ideology mm -hmm. Are we subscribing to? Yeah, probably so, the people who are giving it money, right? So people giving it money, and Jason Horowitz. Yeah. And it, it, again, mm -hmm. I would look. I look forward to connecting mm -hmm. with fellow academics who might be interested to look at some of the yeah. the intersections between privatization. Right. And, the, uh, and related blockchain. to to that idea was when I was reading one of the articles about the long discussions with the Bing chatbot and it, it this hinting that it was wanting to become alive. And one of the authors wrote that part of the issue with that for them was not necessarily that it was, you know, creepy sci-fi or that, that they thought that this chatbot was actually sentient. It was that it could convince people of that. 
Exactly. So that's the same thing if you have it, if you have it labeling some things as we, we can't possibly make light of this because it's so serious. Well, then, you know, someone who doesn't know any better or what, oh, okay, well, I, I guess, guess I can't, yeah, 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 I guess capitalism's right. funny and communism we can't make jokes about yeah. because it's harmed many people or whatever that response said. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the things is like, well, if we're reading this and we're not being critical of it and, or we don't even know to be critical of it. That's it. Then, that's it for the next generation. Yeah. Right? Then there you go. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know if that answered the question, but we, we discussed it nonetheless. <laughs> well, I, I think it leads it's right into one, yeah. our next question from inside the studio. This is, <laughs> right. this is about subjectivity, which is what you're veering into. So the question is, the language of the chatbot is often invoking an I or a me. Yeah. But even in some of your discussions about the chatbot, you use that as well. Someone <laughs> or you've said it. con artist. <laughs> Why do we default to subjectivity in our conversations about a chatbot? What does that tell us about our relationship with AI or computers? That's a really good question. Yeah. I think um, it's, a, it's a really good one, actually, around the con artist thing. Like, we are. Right. Well, Do I think you want to respond first? I, I, I can. But I think it's it's not... I don't know that it's necessarily us responding to the technology by personifying it, but I do feel like it's kind of like a human, it's natural for people to personify everything. Like, and so I feel like it, it comes across, like then we're now personifying other things, like, you know, people name their cars or whatever, you know, there's yeah, stuff yeah. like that. But then there's also the flip side where they have, the, the people who have created chat GPT have gone through a lot of lengths to make it seem like you're talking to a person right, right. or or something like that so it's both our I think human desire to personify things and connect with them and the coding that is yeah. trying to mimic that back at us I, I think it's interesting as the as a personification example what I, I think I intended it as is a teaching tool like mm -hmm. a te you know we use schema we use analogies and sure. metaphors to be able to connect something that we don't know about something is is abstract and new to all of us as generative AI to something that we know. Yeah, we know who a con, what a con artist does. We mm. know their moves. Mm. We can recognize that. Right. And so I, that's that's sort of why I bring that in. Another example that I thought of bringing up as an example of this, maybe it's persona, I don't know, it's it's giving a little bit more of a human example there. Mm. I was on social media the other day and I saw um, this video of a guy in a gym and he had his, this like massive bulge on his bicep mm -hmm. that was clearly fake. And it looked at him and it had been injected with some kind of like fake muscle. And then mm -hmm. he could barely, you know, lift 20, you know, curl 20, 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness, wow. And, and I thought about ChatGPT. I thought, wow, you know what? This is going to allow someone to submit their term paper and say, here, I got, you know, did this thing. Here's the impressive, mm -hmm. you know, look at the outcome mm -hmm. but it's fake it's they mm -hmm. didn't actually build generate the right. muscle themselves it's not so authentic. that's where you were coming out with the metaphor of the con artist you're saying yeah, yeah like that yeah <laughs> yeah and I was <laughs> also that. thinking as you were saying you know what I was trying to do was connect it to something we all know it was interesting because I was thinking of the chat GPT response that I read at the beginning and chat GPT even says like a virtual assistant so connecting like, right. its services or what it does to something that people would know. So yeah. it, it's also mimicking that that way of trying to relate something to what we're already going to know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It very much wants us to believe that it's intelligent. Right. And it is unfortunately really in some ways good at it. Mm. I, I humbly admit to that, <laughs> that it, it, the poem it made, mm -hmm. For a couple of hours, I was like, man, wow, I can't, <laughs> I can't even, you know, this is too mm -hmm. human sounding, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, another question? <laughs> I wonder if we can veer into some ethics questions. Thank you. <laughs> Though we have some philosophers who do ethics in tech, yep. we're going to throw it to you two. We have a couple of people who've asked questions, so I've combined them together. And this is primarily from Helen, is asking about using ChatGPT to provide written evaluations of student writing. So for faculty to respond and do their grading using ChatGPT, and more broadly, what are the ethics of some firm communicating oh, with a client or writing a brief using ChatGPT? Yeah, so in 
we're gonna we're gonna probably talk a lot about this, but I want to like relate it first to the Vanderbilt email. So there was an an email that was sent out uh, at Vanderbilt University that Last was week. a response to the Michigan State shooting, just an, an email sent out to students, and it was generated by ChatGPT and the. The reason that people know that is because the author of, well, author, the, the collaborator the staff, of the, the email, it was a staff person yeah, who made it. they cited it at the end and said this was like paraphrased from conversation Chat with ChatGPT. Yeah. So obviously people got very frustrated with that and upset about that because it was supposed to be a moment of emotional connection to the audience and it seemed completely stifled by the fact that this was generated from AI. And I think that I relate this to the comment of using it to respond to students because I see it very similarly where the students would have an expectation of a connection, maybe not emotional, but at least some sort of connection with the instructor where if the AI is the one commenting on it, then that connection doesn't exist. And I also think that I, I don't know that the AI is able to comment on the student work without significant prompting from the instructor typing in like what it wants the AI to comment on. I don't know if it would be a huge time save either. We were talking no. about that earlier. Like it might be more complicated more to kind of check yeah. through that. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? My thoughts are, you know, my heart is heavy responding to this because it's um, my, uh, what happened in Michigan is horrific mm -hmm. and I, think that it is, I can understand the community's hurt and frustration Absolutely. and disappointment that someone in their staff office would think that, oh, let's just ask ChatGPT what to write. Like, so I understand that frustration. Mm -hmm. So into both of the examples of are these ethical, no, I think both of those were really unethical mm -hmm. um, uh, examples of ways to use the, this in education. I think the bigger question we need to ask is, are we humanizing or are we dehumanizing mm -hmm. education? Mm -hmm. And it, it's deeply concerning to me that this would be seen as a tool to just, oh, got to generate text. Let's just generate some text because mm -hmm. it needs to be done by a certain time point. Right. That is a dehumanizing mm -hmm. tool. We should not be using it in any way for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, um, it's problematic on so many levels. Around the, uh, the question around having an AI do your grading for you. Mm -hmm. No, that's what expertise is for mm -hmm. so teachers and professors have expertise in a particular right. thing it's not to save time or and and it's not even going to do it accurately anyways mm -hmm. so there's all kinds of evidence of ai being used to try to determine eligibility for college look at the protests that happened mm -hmm. in the uk mm -hmm. when it was trying to determine oh who's going to be you know uh get entry into right. a, a higher ed so right. Um, appreciate the question, and yeah. I think these are the conversations we need to have Absolutely. and overarching. Yeah. Are we humanizing or dehumanizing right. education? And right. I think AI is dehumanizing it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I think that we're starting to wrap up here. So I just thanks so much. This was so much fun, honestly. Like it's a it's a heavy topic to talk about, but I just have really enjoyed it in talking about you uh, talking about it with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I. Uh, enjoyed it as well, although it can go in many yeah. different ways. <laughs> it's a difficult topic to, to talk is. about. I yeah. think it's um, really important questions to yeah. ask. So, And yeah. thank, you, that, thank you both yeah. for jumping into this conversation. It happened within a couple of weeks, and we really appreciate our experts coming forward. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this exciting Quick Bites with Roxana Marashi and Sarah West about ChatGPT. We'll be running a few more workshops and maybe even a film festival later on this semester, as well as use, uh, deploying some of our experts in AI here at San Jose State, right in the middle of Silicon Valley. If you didn't catch our entire conversation, please stay tuned for the video recording available soon on h and in Action. Join us for our next Quick Bites forum to discuss the world news. Good night.